and pray for him. Just, just whisper a prayer from where you are um, for him as he shares God's word with us. Thank you, Father, for Peter. And thank you for the gift and the anointing that you have bestowed upon him. And we continue to pray that as he speaks to us this morning from the word of God, that you would give him clarity and that you would fill his heart with boldness, that he will not be shy from speaking truth, from rebuking, from challenging, and from pointing us into to the things in the word of God that we need for training uh, into all of righteousness. That through this word, Lord, what we do not have will be given to us. What we do not know will be taught to us. And what we are not we will be made in the end that we would become like our Lord Jesus Christ. So use him uh, and speak to him, through him, and to all of us to glorify yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Carry the video. Thank you so much. Amazing to be here at Baby Dedication Service. I, I hope you will be... Um, you will walk with me in this journey. I'm very conscious about the time, and, and I'm thinking that that was time well spent, wasn't it? It's just a blessing to see generation after generation after generation just holding fast to the truth that the Lord Jesus deposited in us. And I'm just so grateful. My heart is full and blessed to see grandparents dedicating um, their grandchildren to the Lord. So we have been going through the book of Hebrews. Um, how many were here last Sunday? How many were not here? Let's ask let, let's, let's ask the question that way. Okay, so we have some people who are joining uh, this series, at least as far as Hebrews 3 is concerned. So we end second half of Hebrews 3. <coughs> uh, the church has been going through the book of Hebrews. As the theme suggests there, the, the overarching theme of the book of Hebrews is the glorious Christ. Christ is indeed glorious. And last Sunday, we were looking at the superiority of Christ over Moses. And, and we said that Christ is superior to Moses um, from that text, that's Hebrews 3, 1 to 6, in at least four ways. He is superior in his office. Yes, I caught that silence and interpreted it as the correct answer. <laughs> he is superior to Christ by virtue of his office. Moses was a priest and an apostle of God, but Christ was a high priest and apostle of an even greater calling, an even greater office, an even greater assignment. And Christ was superior to Moses uh, in the degree of his faithfulness. Wonderful, we are catching up. And yes, Moses was faithful in all of God's household, but Christ was faithful to an even higher standard, an even greater degree. His faithfulness and his service was faultless and blameless. And third, Christ is greater than Moses because just as a... The, just as the... Just as the builder of a house is greater than the house itself... And the house belongs to God. The house that is being talked about here is the house, the people of God, the household of faith. It's not a house made of brick or stone or gold or silver. It's a house made of you and I. People of faith become the household of God. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So he died to establish the house, the household of God, the people of God of which he is the head, the head of the body. Amen. And also Christ is superior to Moses by virtue of sonship. Yes, exactly. His position as a son. Moses was a servant and Christ was a son. No matter how faithful the servant is, the servant will never be greater than the son. The servant can be a servant for a duration of time. You can be on contract. Your term of service can come to an end, but sonship is forever. Once a son, always a son. If you're an heir, you're always an heir. If you connect to the father, that connection is permanent. Amen. Hallelujah. So now today we're going to the second half of Hebrews 3. Uh, it's a warning against unbelief. Having heard those things, having heard about the superiority of Christ, having heard about the glorious Christ. <clears throat> I mean, even the degree of the faithfulness of Christ, the degree of his excellence, the degree of his glory. Christ is not just a man. He is fully man and also fully God. And by the way, one of the scriptures that makes this very, very clear is also in Hebrews in chapter 1 and, and verse 8 about the Son. God the Father says about the Son, your throne, O God, will last forever. So when God is speaking about his Son, Jesus is saying, O God, your throne will last forever. And the scepter of your kingdom will be an everlasting one. 
And so with all that knowledge, with all that revelation, with all that glory, how shall we then respond? What is the application that the author of the Hebrews wants to direct our hearts and minds to? And he says in verse 7, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness when your ancestors tested and tried me. Though for 40 years they saw what I did, they, this is, that is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they will never enter my rest. So see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. This is one of those scriptures I hope that, you know, as James said, the word of God can be like a mirror. You can see it and you can see your gray hair or you can see the spot or you can see the, you know, the sleep that's in the eye. But then if you go away and, you know, not wash your face, then it will be tragic. It will be tragic for anybody who listens but not doing the word of God, doing as the word of God says. So there's a stern warning here. There's a start, after preaching about the glories of Christ, the excellencies, the superiority, the majesty, next stop, warning. Like that information you've received, better be, steward, better be stewarded by you well, because there's a pitfall. There's a danger that comes shortly after revelation. You know, some people say, if only I had a sign. God, give me a sign. But this is a prime example that seeing is not necessarily believing. That you can see all you need to see and yet fail to believe. And the failing to believe here is a bit nuanced because it's not just you know, denying the things exist. It's failing to act in accordance with the revelation. And as we go into this a little bit, I, I hope you'll make that distinction a bit more clearly. So the text says in verse 7, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice and so forth, and the author is quoting Psalm 95. That text is lifted from Psalm 95. And I find it interesting because he did not say, as the psalmist says, which would be correct. He says, as the Holy Spirit says, confirming that what, this, what, what the scriptures contain are the very words of God. That when God was inspiring this man to write the scriptures, it was indeed God himself who was speaking. That the word of God is alive. It has the life of God in it. It has the power to transform the dead things to living things. It has the power to help you to cross over from death to life. So it's not just empty rhetoric, it's not just empty word, it's not the imagination of some clever guy. This is the Spirit of God speaking to those who have hearts to hear, ears to hear, and hearts to understand. And it gives a case study here. Do not harden your heart as they did in the wilderness. And by the way, there's also a continuation, by the way. There's a continuation of the story of God, that the story of God has not changed. Because the psalmist, you know, the psalmist was writing this several centuries before the book of Hebrews. And even then, he was giving a flashback of, of an event that happened seven centuries before. So there were many generations before the time of Moses to the
to the time this was written about in the Psalms, and there were many generations from the time of the Psalms to the time of uh, this, this letter, this epistle written to the Hebrews. So it just shows that the story is the same. The story has not changed. God's intention has not changed. His redemption plan has not changed. His purposes have not changed. And, and in the later scriptures of Hebrews, you will see that he remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's now quoting Psalm 95, rehashing an episode, a dramatic episode that happened in the time of Moses. And Moses, as we covered last time, was the deliverer that God had raised to bring out the children of Israel out of captivity in Egypt. They had been there for about 400 years, and, and they had cried, they had, they had been enslaved, and they were persecuted, and, and they were under oppression. And their cries reached God. And God said, I have heard you. It is time for you to come forth. And I will raise Moses, who will go to Pharaoh, saying, God says, let my people go, that they may come out and worship me. And Pharaoh refused. His heart was hard. And God did miracles after miracle, plague after plague, sign after sign, wonder after wonder, until Pharaoh just let go. And they came out. They came to the banks of the sea, the Red Sea. And they couldn't, they were trapped because Pharaoh changed his mind and was following with chariots, 600 chariots. And God did another miracle, a miracle of a kind that has not been seen before or after. The waters of the Red Sea parted and they walked as though on dry land. And when Pharaoh was chasing, the waters closed in on him and he drowned together with his men of battle, the horsemen. And so as they approached, now getting into the wilderness, into the dry land, they sang. You know, Miriam, Moses' sister, led them in a song of praise and worship. And they were jubilant. They were, you know, feeling victorious. They were feeling like they've conquered indeed. God has delivered them. And indeed, you know, they began the, the worship, the instituted forms of worship. Moses went up Mount Sinai, came down with the tablets. He received the tablets from the maker of the galaxy. And then the institutes of the ordinances and the rules and the regulations about worship were instituted. But they soon forgot what God had. And in fact, no sooner had Moses gone there, they said, Where is, maybe he died on the mountain. The smoke was still there. The, the, the wonder was still there. But they made a calf, a golden one. They replaced so quickly. And then what then happened is that Moses then decided to send spies to the promised land. Go, ten I mean, one from each tribe, there are 12 tribes. 12 of you go, get a report. Is it a good land, arable? And they went and came back in 40 days. Going and coming 40 days. Within 40 days, the man had come with a report. Indeed, it is a land of milk and honey. Indeed, it is fertile. Indeed, it is arable. Indeed, there is space for all of us. It is a huge, blessed place. This is the fruit. Look at the size of the fruit. Look at the produce of the land exceedingly fertile, good ground that we have in store. But there's one catch. The land is full of giants, the Nephilim, the descendants of Anak. They are so huge. They are huge, mighty. We are like grasshoppers. We would not be able to overcome them. They would quash us. They would destroy us. But Caleb and Joshua said, no, despite of all those things, with God, all things are possible. We, we are more than victorious in him. He will give us the victory. We will step in. But everybody said no. The ten spies said no. And there was confusion in the camp. It was a confused report. Now, those who were listening had one choice. Now, which report will you believe? And they chose to believe the report about doubt and fear and uncertainty and feeling small and feeling you know, afraid because the giants and the grasshopper analogy was just too much for them to handle. And from that point, they began to complain. Have you brought us here because there are no graves in Egypt? And by the way, we are hungry. Come to think of it, we are thirsty. Do you remember the fish that we used to eat? Oh my goodness, the melons, the cucumbers, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. Oh my goodness, what have we done? Where are we? Why? There's sand in the desert. There is heat in the tent. Wherever it is I go, I don't have water. I don't have food. What is this manna? What is it anyway? I got it yesterday. I'm getting it today. I'm getting it tomorrow. What is this manna? Do you remember the fish, the onions, the garlic? The what in the world have we gotten ourselves into? And on and on they went and complained until Moses was like, these people are going to stone me if you don't intervene. Okay? 
where am I going to get meat to feed all of these people? It was 600,000 men, excluding women and children. So the numbers are ranging between two and three million. Where am I going to get meat for two or three million people? Is there enough fish in the sea? Do we have enough livestock to slaughter? And God said, I will deliver. I will do these things. And they got their meat. But they got punished also because of their unbelief. God had said that he will do it. But when circumstances around them seem to be a little different from what they imagined them to be, they completely backtracked and backslid. You know, faith, as the Bible says, faith, you know, faith is a substance of things not seen. You walk by faith and not by sight. And this is clear evidence that even seeing, seeing does not help an unbelieving heart. Because unbelief is a heart issue. It's not a sight issue. God can make you see everything you need to see. All the signs and wonders. In fact, he told, Jesus told people in the, in the New Testament, it is a what generation that asks for sign? A, do you remember that? It is a wicked generation that asks for a sign. Because if you're not believing what you're hearing, not even the sight will help you believe. Because faith comes by? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith does not come by seeing. So you might think, you know, people might think that, oh, my faith would be strong if only I saw this thing. If only God gave me this sign. But that's not how faith works. Faith is a hearing thing, not a seeing thing. And faith is a heart issue, not a sight issue. In another parable of Jesus and the, and the rich man, Lazarus, you know, when the, when the rich man went to hell and, and he said, let me at least go and warn my, my brothers so that they may not come to this place of torment. And, and, and Abraham was like, you have Moses and the prophets. No, 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 no. But they don't listen to those guys. But if they saw me, <laughs> straight out, straight out, they would surely... <laughs> But then the message was, if they did not believe Moses and the prophets, they surely will not believe even if you rise from the dead and go to warn them. And some of you are thinking, you know, this is Sunday morning, me, I'm full of faith, one of those songs of worship. It can never be me. This can never be me. This unbelief stuff, me, I'm rock solid, foundation, cornerstone, annexed, pro max, it can, you know, anchor. Anchor member of this congregation. This, this, can never, this can never happen to me. But it's put there for a warning. And by the way, this is a message to brothers and sisters. It's not a message to heathen, pagans, witch doctors, warlocks, dragons. I, I don't know what kind of... This is a message to the household of faith, to those who congregate in the name of the Lord. It's like, listen and learn, you know? Experience may be the best teacher, but it doesn't have to be your experience. It could be somebody else's. Apply the lessons and avoid the pitfall. You don't have to walk into it yourself. But it's a question of, are you going to look at the mirror, see the speckles and all those things, see the faults, and then go away and forget? H how does this change? I want to propose three things that you just need to watch out for. Number one, the multitude. The multitude. There's caution about the mixed multitude. You can come out of this place with a testimony, with an assurance that this faith is mine. It was like, you know what Paul was telling Timothy, the faith of your grandmother, Eunice, and your mother, Lois, is now at work in you. I recognize that generation of faith at work. You can feel that generation. I can say I'm in the gap. My grandmother, I've seen that grandmother praying for her child, praying for her grandchildren. I am just there, rooted. This faith is not even going to stop. You can just feel like you have a testimony. Tomorrow is Monday. Yeah, tomorrow is Monday. And you will not come here. You will be elsewhere. And elsewhere, people have different reports. You're thinking you're saved, sanctified, blessed, anointed, favored. You, you go there, you're like, what is going on? People are talking about different things. You prayed for a job. You got your job. When you got there, people are talking about this is the worst job I've ever had. Can you even believe it? They don't even have tea. What? What? There's no last. There's no per diem. You're like, per diem? Me, I never pray for per diem. Me, I pray for a job. 
and God gave me a job. I know where I have come from, and I know where I'm going. This is my breakthrough. But that's just you. Other people have a different report. And so you might even actually start asking yourself, am I actually blessed? Am I actually hashtag blessed as I keep telling you? Am I hashtag blessed? Maybe I'm not. Because people are suffering, people are complaining. The work phone is not an iPhone. <laughs> you know you need to get exposed to what people actually, bare minimum standards. And then you're like, maybe I pronounced myself prematurely. Maybe I'm actually not blessed. The place pastor had fasted and prayed for, congregation laid stretched hands for, is the place people are waiting to leave. <laughs> Am I in the same building? So be careful about the mixed multitude. Because the mixed multitude can change your testimony. You can think I'm stepping out in faith and then you meet people in unbelief. And the testimony changes. Within no time, you're speaking what they're saying. That wasn't your story, but it becomes your story because of the people you chose to hang around with. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, be careful, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. It is a question of who you associate. It has an influence on you. If you choose to stay with people who don't know God, who don't like God all the time, and you don't have an inlet of people who strengthen you and fortify you, what do you think is going to happen? Are you the one who's going to pull them into faith, or they will pull you out of faith? They will pull you down and drag you down. So your company actually can determine, number one, where you're going and how far you're going there. Because this is a journey, after all. We are pilgrims sojourning through this earth. And who you choose to walk with really matters. Where you put your camp, where you choose to spend your time, who you are surrounding yourself with really matters. So you can have your own eyewitness account. I am the one who walked through the Red Sea as though it was dry land. I saw it for myself. I saw God descend on side myself. But you can actually question your own testimony when you spend enough time in a camp that is hostile to God. And slowly your heart begins to become hard. You don't even know when it happens. It's a slow fade. It's a slow fade. You know, a lot of you are strong in the faith. I salute you strong spiritual generals, warriors who tell yourself, I can handle a high degree of toxicity. I can handle it. I can handle it. I can stand, you know, next shoulder to shoulder with naysayers, you know, all kinds of people. I can handle toxicity. But you just, you just watch yourself. You'll start to drift one way or another. You're not a static being. You are either drifting towards God or away from God at any given point in time. You are not stagnant. You're not static. God is the one who doesn't change, but you, you change every day. You change every day, and you're becoming increasingly Christ-like or increasingly not. Number two, so that's the multitude. Number two, there's gratitude. The Bible says in Psalm 77, I will remember the works of the Lord. Psalm 77, 11, 12. I will remember the works of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. So there's a thing to be said about I'm not where I'm in the desert. I'm in the wilderness. I don't even know why I'm here or where I'm, how long I'm here. But whilst I'm here, I must remember that this is not my final destination and this is not where I want to be right now, but I must acknowledge what the Lord has already done. It is the Lord who caused the Red Sea to be like dry land. It is the Lord who has provided every single day. I am hungry, but I have never died. I am thirsty, but I have never lacked. Okay? I have one pair of clothes in the desert, but it has never done what it has never gotten worn out. My feet have never swollen. Okay? I have been sustained. I am alive in Christ. He has delivered. He has done all those things. But it is easy. It is easy to forget and to just focus on the thing you don't have. You're like, you know, sometimes when you look at if those who have prayer journals, you can, you can look at a year, two years, three years back. So you're, sometimes you're just struggling and just pray, God, just take me through COVID. And you're here today. Just take me through this season and you're here today. 
many, many, many of your prayers have already been answered. If you just take back two, three, four, five years, there are many things you're praying for that you're walking in today. But it's so easy to forget about all of that if you have an immediate pressing problem. And you're like, forget about all of that stuff. This is my current situation. This is my need. This is my want. This is my problem. And you can lose perspective. You can lose perspective and think, why, isn't, why, why am I in this desert? That girl's talking about fish and never hears a point. The leeks, it's true. Garlic, actually, by the way, when was the last time I tasted garlic? And onions and leeks, oh my gosh, kachumbari, what can you do with that in the desert? I mean, it's actually, it's actually they have a point. There is a point there, isn't there? There is a point. And you can forget. You can forget the breakthroughs, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the graces, the mercies that have been new every single morning, bringing you to this place in the first place. And just forget about all of that and focus on what's wrong. And everything that comes out of your mouth is this is the problem. This is what is wrong. If you do an analysis of your speech, an analysis of your thoughts, an analysis of your utterances, it's just focusing on the problem. Maybe that problem will get solved. And then you quickly forget about it and focus on the next problem. And it is possible to live your life like that. It's not that the problems are not real. And it's not that we're not supposed to acknowledge them, but it's just a question of, is there an element of gratitude and an element of acknowledging and an element of remembering what God has already done? And do you do that as diligently as you do to make sure that? And if you don't, the heart's position can change. There's some things that you think are for God, but they're actually for you. Things like gratitude, things like giving. You think you're doing it for God. It's actually for your own heart. It is indeed a form of worship, and it is indeed worthy of all those things. But if you fail to do them, it is you who is doing yourself a disservice. You're making your own heart sick. If you say, I will not give, or if you say, I will not give thanks. So there's gratitude that you just need to watch out for. And the last one is attitude. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6, that, you know, without faith it is impossible to please God. For anyone who comes to him must first believe that he exists or that he is. He is. And that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. That God is. If it was he who was saying it, he would say, I am. God is. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He is who he is. His nature, his character, his attributes don't change. His sovereign purposes will be fulfilled. You will not thwart his plan. What he has said he will do, he will do. He is. But you know, it takes more than believing in the existence of God for you to have saving faith. Saving faith is not about believing that God exists. James says, even the demons believe that there is only one God. So you believing that there is only one God in heaven is not enough to save you. Saving faith is not a question of do you believe in the one God. No. There are many in that category, and that's not yet saving faith. And then it's not just about God will do what he says he will do. which is now where these guys were, these children of Israel. God had said it. He had promised them the land. At least promised their ancestor, Abraham, for sure. And they knew that. There was no doubt in their minds as to what God had said. But these guys did not believe that God would do what he said he will do. They had the word of God, but they did not mix it with faith. So the word of God was of no use to them. In fact, it hardened. They hardened their hearts against the word. The scriptures are life. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. The scriptures are life. 
but they also depend on your heart's position. This same message can have a very different transforming effect in different hearers. Just depending on where your heart was when you received it. So here, there's those who received a promise. And you know what the Bible says in Numbers 23 and 19? That God is not a man that he should lie. He is not a son of man that he should change his mind. Does the Lord speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? That's human level, but not God level. God, when he says it, he will do it. He watches over his word to perform it. <clears throat> it is impossible, as the Bible says in Hebrews, it is impossible for God to lie. There are certain things that God cannot do, and one of those things is lie. He cannot lie. It is impossible for him to lie. And so there's a huge struggle when you know God has said something, but he's not manifesting. So what's the problem? It's either he said it and he's not doing it, or I misheard it, or I imagined it. And then there's a third level of faith, which I think most of us have to grapple with every single day, where it's not necessarily the case that God said something very specific about my life. Maybe I'm sick, I need healing. Maybe I'm single, I need a spouse. Maybe I'm barren, I need a child. Maybe I'm jobless, I need a job. And whereas all those things are good things, I don't recall God saying that by this time next year, this is what will have happened. So I know I need it, I want it, I think it's his plan for me, but I have not heard him say it specifically, so I just wait. Okay? My need is urgent, it is important, it's not being met, so I just have to wait. Now what do I do as I wait? If he doesn't come through for me, what does it mean? Now that's a huge turning point. You know, people respond differently to, to abundance and, 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 and difficult circumstances. For some people, abundance makes them, <clears throat> you know, bless the Lord all the more. Some people, abundance makes them arrogant and say, who is the Lord? Excuse me, let me give you my five point. I started, I started this big hotel. This big hotel, you see, I started it with an appetite. <laughs> Slowly but surely, it is now an empire. Look at me, you know? So people respond differently to abundance, okay? And the, the, common, the common assumption is that, is that wealth comes with wisdom. So if you are rich, you must, really, you must really know. You must really know. So you will be invited for conferences and presses and conferences and seminars and podiums and what, and, and you will have to create stuff to explain your good fortune. Because people will imagine, you must be a clever guy. How did you, how? And so it gets to your head. And you're like, oh, by the way, the Lord, <laughs> the Lord, <laughs> it is I. The Lord was there, but guys, look at my you know, CV and everything. Some people react differently. Now, flip the coin in hardship, people react differently. For some people, hardship draws them to God. It makes them forget about flaky friends, flaky things, things that don't matter. Now I am in rags, ashes, I have remembered that there is a God in heaven. I need to trace back my steps. Where did I go wrong, surely? For life to have turned this way, I surely must have gone wrong somewhere. Like the prodigal son, I am not going to wrestle with pigs for food. I am going back to my father's house. It is a wake-up call. Other people react differently to harsh circumstances. They're like, if God loves me, then where is he? If God cares for me, then why did he allow this to happen? I am not going to turn to the Lord. It is the Lord to turn and repent and do this and fix this problem. <laughs> Who is to change here? Who is responsible for this mess? So unless the Lord changes, I'm not going back to him. He is the one who has let me down. He's the one who has disappointed me. He's the one who owes me an apology, an explanation. Right? So people respond differently to circumstances. And so you need, to, you need to guard your heart against those things. Against fortune and against hardship. What is your attitude to the changing circumstances in your life towards God? Who is God to you when you're prospering? 
And who is God to you when you're suffering? Is God in your debt when you're suffering? Is God on the dock answerable to you? And is your relationship with him conditional of him doing what he has said to you or what he wants you to do? And the needs are genuine. The suffering is real. And the wants are urgent. And the desires could be godly. But if he doesn't respond in the time you want him to respond or in the way you want him to respond, will your heart be hard against the Lord? Will you walk away from the Lord? Or will you say the Lord doesn't care, he stopped caring, if he had cared, he would have done this by now? So before you dismiss these children of Israel as being very short-sighted, very blind to the obvious, could they not see the Lord? Could they not see what he has done? Before you say, it can never be me. I'll pray for you guys who are, who are in that level, region, us on this level, can never. So before you say those things, just, just be careful about your heart. This scripture is there to warn you, not your seatmate, not your friend, not your neighbor, not somebody I wish that comes to church today, they hear this person for themselves. No, it is for you. It was appointed for you to hear it. And for good reason. Jeremiah says that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Your heart can do flip-flops like you can. Your heart can disown your better judgment. Your heart can disown what you think you know. So the idea here is simple. Encourage one another. Daily. That's what the Bible says. Daily. As long as it is called today. Encourage one another. Because the, 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 there is strength in unity. And that's why you hear the pastor saying September is full of all kinds of events. There is a reason why, as the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 24, 25, do not get weary of the gathering of together of the brothers. Okay? Do not even stop. Do not, do those, do not stop gathering together. There's a reason for it. Because when you come, you encourage somebody else. And your struggle encourages somebody else. And your testimony encourages somebody else. And your cry of anguish gets people ministering to you. There is a reason that God has told us. Encourage one another daily. Lessons can be learned from nature. If, you, if, you, if you're a fan of nature and stuff like that, if you've watched the wilderness migration and those sort of things, either in person or on TV, you will see how the crocodiles hunt. They just try and isolate when the wildebeest are together, strong in a pack, it is very, very difficult for you to get caught out. But what they do, they wait for the one that has decided, me, I'm crossing this thing alone. Why? Because I'm a ninja. <laughs> because I got this. Not only am I swimming uh, proficient, I, you know, I, I'm also a lifeguard. I also scuba dive. So, so what is this water anyway? The ones who think they can figure this thing out by themselves are the ones that the enemy specifically likes to target. Because you're not in the park. If you isolate yourself, you're making yourself a target. And he will, just like, you know, when Jesus was alone in the wilderness, that's when the enemy came to him. And he attacked him with his notion of who he thought God was. Right? I mean, if God is good, why are you so hungry? Period. If you are the son of God, can't you turn these stones into bread? Which means if God is with you, if the power of God rests upon you, or if God loves you as you think he does, then why are your present circumstances so miserable? It is the same question that Jesus was asked. And it is the same question that the enemy will come and ask you. Yeah. Yeah. If you're so spiritual, sanctified, saved, blessed, hashtag, all those things, can you explain 
your circumstances, discuss 20 marks. By the time you're even trying to put thoughts together, he hammers you with another one. Okay? And then that, that's, that's the crux. That's when people get really confused. And that's when also the world steps in with its own answers. Okay? People are saying now, campaign season is over, tour posters are politicians, workers are waganga. We, we want to get solutions for whatever it is people will get. But the persistence of those posters, the investment that those guys make in printing, pasting, printing, pasting, it means there's some form of demand supply in this country. You can't go print with your own money, paste with your own money. Wake up at 2 a.m., plaster, plaster on the express, you're plastering. It means there is a, there's a market. And so the world will always give answers. But it's pseudo answers, it's fake answers. But if you don't know how to be still and know that God is God, as the Bible says in Hebrews 11:6, that God is. Even if he has not said, he is. Even if he has not done, he is. You will get answers from everywhere. And you will find yourself doing things you never, ever, ever thought you'd ever do, seated in a church on a Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon on the south side. You can surprise yourself. So are you those people who are you like Job who says, even though God slays me, I will still trust in him. Or like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego who said, I know God is able to deliver me from this furnace that you have set up to destroy me. But even if he does not, he remains to be God. So you need to guard your heart against the changing circumstances of life, the vicissitudes of life. God has not promised you an easy life. We all want it. We all want it. You know the Kenyan dream, one wife, two kids, three bedroom house, four wheel drive, five acre plot. We all, we, I mean, <laughs> sign me up. That's a five-fold ministry that some people have signed up for. In this life, this one of fivefold ministry. I don't know. I don't know about that. Me, the fivefold ministry I want, or I've signed up for. You know, you know what you want. But the funny thing is, it's not that common. It's a very. I mean, it's not that rare. It's a very common thing. But you know what Christ said? Christ said, "In this life, you will have trouble. But be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world." So. It's not that we have been promised ease and that God disappoints us by going against his, his promises. It's just that we need to guard our hearts so that when we receive abundance and when we go through seasons of lack, God remains to be God and our hearts are not hardened against him. Let me ask the pastor to pray for us. Thank you for just the way you have used Peter to speak. And thank you for every challenge and every encouragement that he has spoken. I pray that you who is faithful 
to watch over your word to fulfill it. That you would watch over this word and fulfill it in our lives. Let it accomplish in every one of us according to the measure of our need. I pray that by this word, every stubborn and hardened heart would melt. I pray that this word will rest in our hearts, that we will meditate upon it, that we will shut out every other conflicting voice, and that we would spend time on this word, that it would speak to each one of us individually. So give us the courage to do that, so that the cares and worries of this world would not rob us of the joy, of the power that is in your word to transform. That's what we desire. As we continue to reason together with you through this book of Hebrews, Lord, I'm praying for even a deeper revelation. Lord, begin to stir up questions in our hearts. Begin to stir up conversations in our small groups about this word and that there would be such growth in us and such advancement in our knowledge of God. And as we go into this week, Lord, I pray that you'll cause us to rest in who we are in you. That we will not look to the right or to the left, but look to you and follow your voice because only you have ordained paths of righteousness for us. And we desire that we will walk in them. I pray for every heart and every mind that is here. May we go in that victory that we have in you and in the strength that you have given us in Christ Jesus. So child of God, receive these blessings. I say we speak these blessings not because we want things to come to you. We speak these blessings to remind you that you are blessed. You are already blessed, not because of what you have, but because of your position in your father's house. So be reminded that you are blessed. From the tip of your head to the sole of your feet, you are soaked in the blessing and the anointing of God for your life. And that blessing is for all of eternity. So rest assured, stand firm in hope, stand firm on the foundation that is our Lord Jesus Christ. And do not waver. Do not get weary. Do not allow unbelief to consume you to the point that you drift away from your father, but that you would stay in endurance and patience with God and his spirit enabling you. The Lord bless you and keep you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. May he give you peace within and without. May he surround you with his peace on the left, on the right, front, back, below, above and inside for all the days of your life. Your family is blessed. Your children are blessed. Your food is blessed. And your water is blessed. To the honor and glory of God, whose Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we have prayed. Amen and amen. See you again. God bless you. Please, let's share together in a cup of tea. Amen. Thank you, Peter.